All right, so here we're gonna talk about integrals. We're starting integrals. And I think I'll spend three lectures on integral. And after that, it's the last unit for this course. So first for this section is the definition and the condition that, uh, that makes sure the integral exists, like the existence. So first, before we define integrals, we have to define what is partition on an interval. So a partition is basically a set of points such that, you know, such that, so it's really, really straightforward, right? You have a point, there are partitions. This is A, this is B, right? And we define delta xi to become this, right? And now we have, suppose f is a function, and we want to make sure f is bounded, and it's a real value function on the interval. So, <laughs> for each, um, <clears throat> for each partition for or for each section we divided, right? For each section we divided, we let for x between them we let capital M I to be the supremum of the output. Well, this is well defined since f is a bounded function, right? So on this interval, f is also bounded, so its supremum and infimum both exist. And now we're going to define the upper sum to be written like this. So you add up all the sections. And similarly for lower sum. So you basically add up all the uh, lower bounds, right? And then <coughs> we define the, the upper integral. We define the upper integral to be the infimum of the upper bounds, which is the lower, the greatest lower bound of the upper sums, and the lower integral to be the upper bound, the least upper bound of the lower sums. And you might ask, the infimum of set of what? Like, what is the... What the hell? All right, <clears throat> and the set of all upper sum, what does that mean? It means the set of all partitions P from the partition on A, B. So for any P, for all the partitions. And if they, if they both exist and they equal to each other, we define, we define their common value by the integral from F to from A to B, F dx, right? <clears throat> well, you might ask why the infimum of the upper sum exists? Why is it bounded? Because F is a function that is bounded, while for any partition, for any partition, right? The upper bound for, for, upper bound for a certain partition the upper, the upper sum for a certain partition is always less than or equal to the, the global maximum, right, times, times each, the global maximum times each delta i, delta, no, 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 the global maximum tel, times each delta x i, and if you take their sum, it is telescoping, right, from 1 to n, if you take your sum, it eventually is going to become m b minus a. It's similar for this, which means that for any partition, the upper bound is bounded by this and by this, right? So it is bounded, and this one is also bounded. So their infimum and suprema exist, which means that the upper and lower integral is well defined. So <coughs> the question of their equality which is the question of integrability, int integrability, integrability, <laughs> integrability of f is a more delicate one. So, and now we're going to introduce another integral, which you might never seen before, is the called the riemann stelges integral. Well, this integral is basically we define for alpha. Alpha is another function that is increasing on a function. 
an increasing function on an interval, and we let alpha a and alpha b to be finite so that, so that, so that its partition, delta alpha i looks like, is not going to explode, right? So, <coughs> so if they're finite and follows that alpha is bounded, well, corresponding to each partition, so for each partition, we define delta alpha i to become alpha of x i subtracted alpha of x i subtracted by alpha x i minus 1. Well, straightforward, right? So you have each x i minus 1 x i for, uh, for them. Uh, for them, you again you again have alpha x i, alpha x i minus one. It's like for each partition, right? You again have an alpha, alpha partition. So they're function values, right? Simple, right? Like easy, right? Simple. Yeah. So is it clear that each of them is greater than or equal to zero? So again, we define their upper sum by, by this is the partition, this is the f function, and this is the alpha function. Right, we define their upper sum, their lower sum, their upper integral, their lower integral, and the, if they're equal, Riemann's Stelios integral. Well, if they are equal, we said n is integrable with respect to alpha in the Riemann sense. So we write this notation, a fancy r alpha. All right. That's enough for our introduction. <coughs> so we're going to define what is a refinement. It's basically a finer partition, right? It contains the re original con it contains the original partition, but it has more points. And their common refinement for given two partition is their union, which is evidently a finer a refinement of one of them, right? So here's a theorem. It says like, oh, if P starts a refinement, then their lower sum increases and their upper sum decreases. Well, this can be illustrated by a diagram. Nah. Well, a standard graph like this. So for each partition, for each partition, Suppose you have this partition, and <coughs> this is their upper sum. Uh, this is their upper sum. And this is their lower sum, right, for this interval. And again, for this one, this is their upper sum. And this is their lower sum. Right? And for this interval, again, this is their upper sum. And this is their lower sum. We're taking the infimum of the function value, right? And again, for this one, this is their upper sum. And this is their lower sum. Right? Upper sum and lower sum. And <clears throat> if it gets finer, if you have a finer partition, then the upper sum is like, it tends to get even smaller, right? Like the upper sum tends to get smaller. So it's intuitive, but we, we have to prove it. No. It's intuitive, but we have to prove it. So how do we argue with this? Well, 6.4. So basically, suppose that if a refinement has only one more point, if p star equals to p union, union, if it has only one more point, exactly one more point where x is not in this original partition, then and we let this in sit in between one of the 
intervals, small intervals, right? So it's like you have x i minus one, you have x i here. Suppose you have x star here, right? And we take um, w one equals to infimum of f taken value from this. So this is w1 and also this is w2 likewise. Right? This infimum of x star. <coughs> Right, so this is W1, this is W2. It's taken the infimum of output during in between this little interval and again between this little interval. While, and consider MI, little MI. It's the lower bound of the entire, in, of, of the entire interval. Well, this means that MI is less than or equal to W1 and less than or equal to W2, right? You can prove it, it's simple, because, because MI is the greatest lower bound of this, which is, so MI is the lower bound of this, of in between these intervals, and then it must be a lower bound of these intervals, which means that it is less than or equal to the greatest lower bound in this interval, which is W1, right? <coughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah. And then we have, if we take your difference, if we take your difference, you have this new partition minus original <coughs> partition. If you take your difference, it will become W1 times alpha x star minus alpha x i minus 1 plus W2 of alpha x i minus alpha x star minus m i of alpha x i minus alpha x i minus 1. Right, because the only thing different between p star and p is this interval. And outside the world, the world outside of it, they're all the same. So if you subtract them, they all disappear, right? And we only consider in this little world, which means that, which gives this. Well, okay, now we, if we continue, right, we have this is equal to, I'll just write it out first of alpha x star minus alpha x i minus one, right? Plus w2 minus m i times x i minus alpha x star. Well, here's the elementary uh, algebra happening. So basically, right, for here, you have w i times this, right? And they have minus m i times this, right? But where do we have the minus m i times alpha star, alpha star, alpha x star? And then right here, we then add it back again. So we're chilling, basically adding up zero. Well, now we analyze. Okay, for this expression, we have this greater than zero. We state it here, right? We state it here. This is greater than zero. This is greater than zero because alpha is monotonic increasing. This is greater than zero. Again, this is greater than equal to zero because alpha is monotonically increasing, which means that entire thing is greater than equal to zero. <laughs> so, if, so which means this is greater than zero, right? Well, if it contains one more point, then it gets larger. If it contains like finitely many number more points, we can repeat this argument by like 
finitely times, and then we again get the same result. So we're done. And also for the upper sum, it's similar. It's really similar, almost the same. So for simplicity, I just omit it. And now we're going to prove another intuitive looking result, which is the lower integral is less than equal to the upper integral. Well, I wonder why you call them lower and upper, because the lower is less than the upper, right? And we should prove it. Um, 6.5. Okay, so for P1, P2 in the partition, right, we define P star be their common refinement, be their union. So immediately we have that this is a refinement of P1 and also refinement of P2, right? Refinement, and we can use the result above. If it's a refinement, then we have this, this, and this, right? So we apply it, we have L of P of alpha minus L of P star, P star F alpha less than equal upper sum this is obvious, again, less than upper sum of P F alpha, right? This is P1, this is, this is P2, this is P1. Right, P1, P2, P star common, and we use apply above theorem. Above theorem, by above theorem, we have this, right? So, this gives that L of P1, F alpha, less than or equal to U of P2, F alpha, for any P1, P2, belongs to a partition for any partition on A to B, right? Well, this means that, okay, if we fix, if we fix the P2 and the P1 is taken over all the partitions, right? This can be taken, right? Because if we fix this and this varies, which means that this is the upper bound of all the partitions, which means that it is greater than or equal to the least upper bound, which is the supremum of the lower sums, which is by definition the integral, the lower integral, less than or equal to the upper sum. And now again, we keep this fixed and we take P2 as a variable being all the partitions, then we have this lower integral is a lower bound of all the upper sums, which means that it should be less than or equal to the greatest lower bound, which is by definition, <laughs> less than or equal to the <laughs> upper integral of the alpha. And we're done. So Changsha. Okay, okay, so now we move on. We know that if f, the integral exists, it looks very, uh, like the condition given is really hard to decide. Oh, you have to compute their infima, you have to compute their supremum, and you have to compare them, which is really uh, tedious. But we, if we, we given this property, which is a convenient way to determine if, uh, if the function has integral, which is equivalent state uh, equivalent condition of being integrable, integrable out. So, it says that okay for, if it's it's equivalent to that okay for any epsilon. There exists a partition. 
such that the difference between the upper and lower sum with respect to this given partition is less than epsilon. Well, this is really, really similar to the limit definition of sequences and the limit definition of functions, right? Because you have a, their difference can get arbitrarily small with a given partition. You can always find a partition that makes the upper and lower sum arbitrarily small. Then you have the integral exists. Okay, so this is kind of magic, but so we prove this direction first. So for this direction, suppose that we have for any epsilon greater than zero, right? For so the lower sum with respect, so there exists a partition, right? There exists a partition such that with this partition. I just didn't write the F alpha, I'm just, just, you know what I'm saying, right? This, F D alpha, F D alpha, P. Well, this means that F D alpha minus F D alpha is less than equal to, no. It's less than epsilon. Why? Because so we have, suppose we have this LP alpha, lower integral, upper integral, and the upper sum. The difference, the difference between them is less than the difference between them. And they are less than epsilon. So this is less than epsilon. Which gives that Well, they're also critical to zero, right? They're also critical to zero because, like, from if you move it to to here, no, no, no. if you move it to here, it's the last theorem, right? Wait, wait, wait. Uh, upper, the upper minus lower. Yeah. And this is greater than zero. Oh, something, uh, I messed up. It should be upper minus the lower, right? Upper minus the lower. Well, okay, if, if this holds, which means that this is for any epsilon greater than zero, right? Which means that this minus this should be less than or equal to zero greater than or equal to zero, which means that, which means that, right? Okay, for this direction, for di this direction, so we have for any epsilon greater than zero, right? We know that since there is this partition P2 such that less than equal, uh, less than F D, uh, less than equal of F D alpha plus epsilon over two, right? Because, well, because, okay, this is like upper sum. Upper sum is the upper integral, right? Well, what it saying is like, okay, so um, for any number, this is greater than the upper integral, which means that it is not the lower bound because this is the greatest lower bound, which means that there exists an element such that it is um, less than this because this is not lower bound, right? And then because because the integral exists, we can just, right? So similar logic.
Mm -hmm. And we define P to become their uh, common refinement. Then we have U of P, right? This partition, this by definition is less than F D alpha plus epsilon over two, right? Which is less than so this plus over two, which means that these both sides plus epsilon, right? Right. Th this plus epsilon is equal to this. And again, it's less than this plus epsilon. Less than L of P plus epsilon. Um, P2, P1. Right, P1, and this is less than or equal to, by our first theorem, right, if it's finer, then the lower sum increases, epsilon, right. So, we have this, this, we have P, F, alpha, minus lower sum, P, F, alpha, less than epsilon. Also, it means that for any epsilon greater than zero, right, we have a we have a partition such that a difference is less than epsilon, and we're done with the both direction. It's a long way to go. There's a lot more to go. Okay. Okay. So. I marked this 13, right? This is the this is the inequality. So let me just copy this. No no no. Okay. Let me just copy this to here. So if this holds for some P and some epsilon, then it holds for refinement, for every refinement. With same epsilon, it holds, so if this for some p, suppose this holds for some p naught, this holds for some p naught, then for any p that is farther than p naught, then we have, it still holds for this p. Well, this is, a and B says that okay if this holds and for arbitrary points in between so S I and T I is in each of the little little sub intervals right then we have this uh, we have this inequality holds and again if this f is integral, the integral exists, and the hypothesis, which means that if the hypothesis is like s i and t i for arbitrary points, then like this holds for arbitrary t i in between them. Right. Okay, now we prove it. So for part A, right? Part A is trivial because, because we have P, uh, no, 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 we start from lower. So suppose it holds for P naught and P is finer than this, right? P naught, well, again, right, you have this, this, these two four points, the distance between them is less than distance between them, is less than epsilon, again, so part A, we're good, right, for any refinement. And if this holds, for P isn't, so for, uh, um, so if this holds for 
P and if S I T are arbitrary points, then this holds. So, so if S I and T I are in X I minus one X I, then we have that F of S I, F of T I, they are in between this, right? The supremum and femum of output. Well, this means that their distance less than or equal to mi minus mi. It lies, it lies in between them, right? Then their distance must lessen the length of the entire interval. Well, we have not defined length yet, but, right? Well, this means that this means that if i is 1 to n, if you take their sum f of si minus f of ti, this with respect to the alpha function, this means that n of mi minus low mi delta alpha i, right? Because we have this, so we have this, this again. Uh, bah, 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 bah. This is equal to sum of mi delta alpha i minus the sum of little mi delta alpha i. Well, this by definition is the upper sum p f alpha minus the lower sum p f alpha less than epsilon. Oop. Uh, boop. Right. So part B is done too. And now we're here to part C. Part C says that, okay. So if the integral exists, and for any epsilon, there is a partition such that this holds, right? The, like if f is the integral exists, which means that this holds for any epsilon, right? Right? If f the integral exists, fancy capital R. If the integral exists, then we have, that means that, okay, for any epsilon, there is a partition such that this holds, right? And, and then, then we let ti be arbitrary points between them. Then we have, it gets arbitrary close to the integral. Well, yeah. For any epsilon, it gets smaller than exit a partition such that. Okay, so it basically says that before we prove that, okay, for any epsilon, it for any epsilon greater than zero, we can have their upper and lower d difference as less than this epsilon. So, ep so their error gets smaller and smaller, which like leads to that the integral exists. Well, there's an equivalent definition, which means that, okay, if, if this integral exists, then we have their arbitrary. So it's like, oh, like, like taking the value of rectangles. If you take their upper sum and their lower sum, like, okay, their difference gets smaller and smaller. And likewise, if you're taking arbitrary, like, arbitrary outputs, and then you generate your rectangle, and then you generate your rectangle, right? So for this partition, like, generate rectangle, right? It is, it, it can get arbitrary close to the integral. So, this one's P F of T I delta alpha I un P right for some P for some partition P right and also we have this U P L P and and you know if it lies between them, then you have 
a beautiful inequality, which means that the sum and the integral gets arbitrary <coughs> close to each other. This is my favorite inequality. The sum and the integral gets arbitrary close. It's abbreviation, but, right? Okay. <coughs> so basically, the sum is the integral, like something like that. Okay, you now we have, I think we have four more, right? One, two, three, four more. Four more conditions of being integrable. Integrable. Uh, what the fuck? I don't know. <laughs> okay, whatever, but okay. So if f is continuous, then the integral exists. Well, all the graphs I drawn. All these graphs I drawn, they're all they're all continuous functions, so you can integrate them. Right. <clears throat> well, so if you take a look at this, it is continuous on a closed interval, which means it implies that it is uniform continuous. Continuous on a closed interval imp implies that it is uniform continuous. Well, and we use the equivalence, we use the equivalence proven above here, right? Then we have that, okay, if we let epsilon, fuck, it's three, epsilon greater than zero, we know that because we're given that <laughs> the alpha, the alpha is monotonally increasing. And again, by the Archimedean property, by AP, we've had, Hey, AP, bro. <laughs> By Archimedean property, AP, we have, there exists S such that S times epsilon is greater than this. So, which means that we have that alpha B minus alpha A times one over S less than epsilon. And then we let the nita equals to one over S. So evidently, it needs less greater than zero, right? Okay. Hmm. So we have, so basically we have this times nita, right? We're good. Now, since f is uniformly continuous, which means that for this epsilon given above, there exists a delta that only depends on this epsilon, such that for any x and t lies in this interval, we have that x, this in place. This is the definition of uniform continuous. Oh, no. No, 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 no. For this nita. Now, if we keep going, we let p be a partition on a to b, such that each of their length is less than delta. Well, this is a crucial because if their length is less than delta, then for any two points, we have this is true, and we take a sum, something's gonna happen, right? So, also we have, also, it is uniformly continuous on AB, which means that it is uniformly continuous on every Subintervals, it's been divided, right? So if it's continuous on subinterval, which means that it is continuous on a compact set, which means that its image is compact, which means the image is close and bounded by the Henry Burrell theorem from lecture nine, which means that it can attain its maximum and a minimum on its subinterval. So we have m i m i, right? For y one, y two. Boom. And then take your difference. It's between f of y1 minus f of y2. It's less than nita by our assumption. <coughs> and now we take your uh, difference. The upper sum minus the lower sum, which is mi delta of i which is less than nita times 
which is equal to neta times alpha b minus alpha a. And we're done. So continuous and place in a group exists. Okay, this is the first one. We have three more. So if F is monotonic, so it doesn't mean we don't need F to be continuous. If it's only required, it's monotonic. And but we require the alpha being continuous. Then the integral still exists. Of, of <coughs> course, alpha is monotonic because we're uh, our very first assumption. Right. So this one, um, so the key point is that alpha is continuous. Then we can imply the intermediate value theorem for the function alpha, right? So we let this, and now here's the construction. So for any <coughs> natural positive integer n, we choose a partition. We choose a partition such that so we choose a partition such that each the length of each like the sub interval is equal to this. Well, okay, so like I draw a diagram, it's gonna be easier. So this is alpha A, alpha B, and then if we divide this like evenly, right? Each of their length, each of their length is this alpha B minus alpha A to some n, each of their length, right? They're all the same length, but how is this even possible, right? Like why we can take this subdivide interval, like we can do this because for any um, value in this interval, because alpha is continuous. Alpha is continuous means that we have the intermediate val value theorem, right? If we have the intermediate value theorem, which means that for any point, say this, there is this an output such that alpha x is equal to this. For this, like for any alpha y, right? So this such construction, we're possible. It, it is possible. It's doable. I'm just explaining some easy stuff to you guys. So by intermediate value theorem, right? Intermediate value theorem. Right, they're all possible by an intermediate value theorem, and we suppose that we just suppose that f is increasing. Then we let m i, and it's evidently equal to x i, and m i is equal to right. Well, this is trivial, so we take the sum. It's gonna be equal to uh, their length, right? Alpha B minus alpha A over N <laughs> times alpha X I minus alpha X, I. no, F of X I, right? This was our delta alpha I, but this holds for any n, for some n, right? For for some partition, right? Then this is equal to. There's a telescoping series again. Well, the the absolute value can be. No, this is like a this is a ra ra bracket. So, this. is less than epsilon when this holds fuck this holds 
when n is sufficiently sufficiently large by the Archimedean principle by AP. So we have f is in an integral. <laughs> so we have so it says that okay the f is monotonic and need not to be continuous but the alpha if f of is continuous then we have the integral still exists right so we have this one so this one says that okay if f is bounded and has only finitely many points of discontinuity and alpha is continuous at every point where f is discontinuous, alpha is continuous, then the integral still exists. So let me just make a chart to make this simpler to understand. We have alpha x and fx alpha x. We have fx is bounded, monotone, right? And we have if f is continuous, then the uh so does the, does the integral exist does the integral exist yes when f is only continuous <coughs> and yes when f is monotone and alpha is continuous right so so this, this must hold always. This is by definition, this always holds. But if f is continuous, then it, the integral exists. If f is monotone, the alpha is continuous. <laughs> Bro, <laughs> then the integral exists. Well, it have, if it has only finite discontinuity, and alpha is continuous on point or f discontinuity, then the integral still exists. Right, so we shall prove this theorem. So, uh, six point ten. What the fuck? Okay, so we need two supporting lemma. We need two supporting lemma. Fuck. So, lemma one. Lemma number one, we have for any a, b lies in this interval, then we have f a minus f b is less than or equal to m i minus m i. So for any function value in between this interval, their difference is less than the supremum subtracted by the infimum. Well, so to prove this, we know that by definition, right? Well, this, we, it gives that f of a is less than or equal to mi and negative f of b is less than equal to negative mi which means that f of a minus f of b less than equal to the capital mi minus little mi and again we have f of a is greater to mi negative f of b is greater than equal to the negative mi it gives that f of a minus f of b is greater than equal to mi minus mi so if we combine these two it gives that f of a minus f of b, right? So we're done. And lemma number two, lemma number two is a fancy one, I think. Yeah, we're going to use these two lemma for our next two theorems. So the supremum of a minus the infimum 
of B supreme A minus infinity B is equal to supremum of the set of all A minus B. This is lemma number two. This is done. Also, for this proof, we have to know that the supremum, the negative or supremum negative A is the infimum of A. You can prove it on your own, but we're short on time, so I'll just skip this. Th this is trivial. Supremum of A plus B is equal to supremum A plus supremum of B. Well, this is also true, but... Okay, so the thing is that I proved them in my calculus assignments, so... So I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm traumatized. So... <laughs> we have, if you, so... The supremum of A minus B equals to supremum of A plus negative B. Grade 2 math. So it's your supremum of A minus supremum of plus supremum of negative B's, which is the supremum of A minus infimum of B's. Okay. So uh, we have two lemmas, and we shall start proof our theorem. The proof. Okay. So the proof it says that okay f is bounded, so f has fi finally many discontinuity points. So we let. Right? And M to be the supremum of this. Oh, well. Right. Be become defined as the supremum of all the output values. And we let E to be equal to the set of all points such that X such that such that S no 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 such that F this continuous at X then we have the continuous on E right this is by our assumption now for each for each point, for each point, we have that alpha of alpha of x and e can get arbitrary small. We can let this be arbitrary small, right? Like just okay, just hold on, right? This gets arbitrary small, which means that alpha of u j minus alpha of v j by the triangle inequality, right? This again gets arbitrary small. Because these two gets arbitrary small, then their sum also gets arbitrary small. Then with with any point, right? With any point u j v j and some delta neighborhood around E. Right, this is because because it's continuous, right? As long as they're in the, the neighborhood. Well, okay, so this means that we can make uj, vj such that E lies in between them. Well, this is, of course, a subset of N, F, delta E, right? Well, this is, again, a subset of A, B, right? <coughs> if this is a subset of A, B, 
So said this is true. And the sum of all the given less than epsilon. So, okay, so it's like, it's like the sum, so for each point of this continuity, um, each point of this continuity, alpha is continuous at that point, so which means that alpha and e can get arbitrarily small, right? Arbitrarily small for any UJ in this neighborhood, and we make, uh, generate a new neighborhood that contains e inside, and each of this res uh, each of this corresponding function value, right? Each function value also gets arbitrarily small. And we want that such that the sum of all such distance is less than the epsilon given. This is doable. This is, of, of course, doable, right? It's, of course, doable. Like, because, because E is finite. Doable. Since E... E is finite. And we can just let the alpha uj minus alpha of vj less than, say, epsilon over the cardinality of E, right? This is doable. This is doable. Right, so we have this holds, this holds, okay, like this is less than these, two. like, you know, you know what I'm saying, so, okay, this E is finite ensures that this will not tend to zero, right, because we don't want like zero distance or something, you, you know what I'm saying, so, now, here's the key point, so here, Right, suppose this is A, this is B. We have these two points, these points being discontinuous, and we have the, for each of them, we have something, no, we have something interval, right? This is the al alpha, this is the alpha function. And for each of them, now, we we remove we remove this we remove this so which means that okay if we remove this then the resultant so for so so, so um we remove we remove uj vj from AB. So we dig a hole. We dig finitely many holes at AB. We dig holes. Like diggers, you know. And, <clears throat> and, then, and then now the resultant interval be, then becomes this. Right, so we're 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 a bunch of diggers, and then so we have a suppose we have a we have a interval, right? And for each for each point of discontinuity at f, we have so so we have an original interval, right? And then we have our u j v j, we have our u j v j being defined closed interval, and then we remove u j v j from the Original interval, which means that these are the ones we removed. If we removed, so we dig a bunch of holes on the interval, which is so we, we're goddamn diggers, and then the resultant interval is just a union of closed interval, which is closed and bounded, which is compact. So call the result 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 set k k is compact. Right, they're closed. You because 
finite union. Again, finite. Finite union of closed sets is closed. So this set is closed and they are bounded, right? They're of course bounded. So they are closed and bounded because we're talking about real numbers. So which means that it is compact. It is compact. And F is continuous on those points. F is continuous on these intervals because F is discontinuous at this point, but it's continuous at any other regions, which is continuous on K, which means that F is uniformly continuous on K because K is compact. So, This implies it could be less than epsilon for the given epsilon for st and k, right? And now we form a partition. Form a partition P. Such that. Such that. U, J, V, J are in P. And U, J, V, J, this is empty. Which means that none of the points in the partition lies, none of the point in the partition lies in between them. None of the points in partition. So the only part of partition is like this, 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 this. Like it cannot be inside those. <clears throat> Raw J. For all J. For again for other x of i minus 1 does not equal to uj we let their length be less than delta this is right we let their length less than delta uh, let me write it more clear integral theory let this less than delta okay now Note that something's happening. M i minus little m i. Of course, this is trivial, right? And by triangle inequality, again, this is less than. Right? Because. This is what we define. It's a supreme. This is a global supremum, which is of course greater than the local, you know, local and global. Right, the global supremum is of course greater than the local supremum because and lower bounds, of course, less than the upper bounds. We're all good. So, so we have when x of i minus one. It's not so when when the partition is not one of the uj's we have <coughs> we have what we have mi minus little m of i is less than epsilon why whoa huh so we know that f is uniformly continuous right so we have f is uniformly continuous. Uniformly continuous, which means that, okay, for each this, points lies between them, right? <coughs> f is uniformly continuous on a compact set, which is uniform, then the image is closed and bounded, which means that f can attain its maximum and minimum in between this in between this interval the interval x i minus one x i 
So it attains its maximum and minimum between them, right? If it attains its maximum and minimum. But it means that their input are still delta close to each other, right? So this, of course, then we have mi minus mi because it attains its minimum, it attains its minimum and uh, uh, maximum in this interval. And this interval length is less than a delta, so they're a delta close to each other and it applies this is less than epsilon. So, so the upper bound of This is equal to, by definition, right? Now, we'll break into two parts. This is less than or equal to. So, we'll break into two parts. Parse where the world of this and also parse about the boundary points, the boundaries, the, the boundaries, right? So we have this is less than epsilon delta alpha i plus Right, always have, we always, so this less than equal to 2m is always gonna happen. But, but when, when x is not boundary points, we have this holds. But other than that, of course, we're, at least we're guaranteed that this inequality holds, right? Plus 2m. Right. Alpha i. Right. Again, this is less than the whole thing. Plus. Q M alpha, right? Okay, so here again, why is this this less than with alpha? Because by our assumption above, right, the sum of all their delta alpha i, right, is less than epsilon, which here now implies this. Of course, like this is the partly thing, and it's of course less than the whole thing, right? These are the the ones where x x i is not equal to x minus i is not equal to like u j or whatever. The boundary, the dot boundary part, but no matter what, it is this sum is of course less than the entire sum, right? <laughs> well, you can factor this. Arbitrary small. This less than this, less than this. Actually, this is should be strictly less, right? Strictly less. So we have their difference is strictly less than constant times epsilon, but epsilon is arbitrary, so it doesn't matter. Which means that. Which means that the integral exists. Okay. So and now I'm gonna prove a composite function. Composing functions. Think about composing functions. So basically, um this is the last one, the last one of this integral lesson. So, part one. Let, so it says, that, okay, f is, 
suppose f, you can integrate f, and it is bounded. It's bounded. And the phi is continuous on this interval. It is continuous on this interval. Although f is not surjective to this interval, we're not, we're not saying that is true, but no matter how f performed, the phi, we assume that it is continuous on this entire interval, right? And we let hx is equal to phi of f of x on ab, then this, the integral exists for this. Okay, so. We'll just use the equivalent, right? The equivalent of being integrable. So we let this time greater than zero. Since phi is uniformly continuous on mm, so there is this delta such that we have both delta less than epsilon and s minus t less than equal to epsilon implies that phi of s minus phi of t yep so ooh, so 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 this is by just write out the definition of uniform continuous and here's the crucial part is like we want this delta less than epsilon oh this is of course because if you're if you're say Say like if this delta is given, right? Suppose you have the original delta naught such that such that whenever they're not. And now you take your delta less than if any delta is less than equal to delta naught, right? Then when S when the distance between S and T is less than delta, and it's again less than delta naught. So so this still holds. And we can just let this delta be really, really small such that, is, such that it is less than epsilon. Right? Like, we can do this. Right? We can do this. You agree, right? We can do this. So, as f, the integral exists for f, right? So we have there exist a partition. Is a partition such that it's less than like this gets arbitrary small, right? This of course gets arbitrary small. And then we define numbers M I M I for F. And then we have the star version. These are for H. These are for H. The supremum and femum of output and the, 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 the partition intervals, right? So, <laughs> so we know that, huh? We let 1 to n equals to the union of two sets such that if this is less than delta, then we have i as an a. Otherwise, we have i as in b, right? So it's like for, for the, the partition. So for the partition, right, if they're corresponding this, it's less than delta, then we have i is an a. This is less than b. And a or b, they might be empty, but it's okay. It doesn't matter. They might be empty. Right? And we'll apply lemma 1. Lemma 1. What does lemma 1 say? It says that any two points between is less than this. Right? So this means that, this means that for any A, B, we have 
f of a minus f of b less than equal to m i minus m i for i and a this right so this means that okay again f a and f b are less than uh, delta and which means that which means that Right, which is which says that h of a minus h of b epsilon. Right, right, and now we apply lemma two. We apply lemma number two. We have. This is by definition, right? This is by definition. Infinity of h of x is equal to supremum of the set of all differences. Well, this is less than or equal to the supremum of the set of all absolute value absolute value of differences right like this and since um epsilon epsilon is the upper bound of all such sum right because for any a and b right we have this is true which means that this is should be less than or equal to epsilon Right, because this is the least upper bound. This this is the upper bound. Which means that which means that this less than epsilon. Right? Right. Okay. For I and B for I and B we have This is less than equal to this is the triangle inequality. This is less than again. Well we define K. I think we define something here. Mm. Oh. Less than equal to K plus K. Let me explain what is K where k equals the supremum of all by t for t <coughs> thank you <coughs> this is similar logic so we have for i and b now again we now now here's the now again we have um for the i and b m i subtract that n i delta alpha i because i is and uh b right and um i is and b i is and b Like i is in b when this is true. Squared and or equal to delta. So i is in b. But again, we have that this is less than or equal to the entire sum, right? 
right? Wild and tiresome. Bruh. <laughs> the entire sum. This is less than, upsa, less than delta squared. So we have this less than delta squared. Well, now look at both sides. Look at these two sides. Less than this, which implies that. <laughs> Bruh. Delta alpha i is less than delta. <laughs> so, now here's the climax of this lecture. We're having the coolest inequality for this hour. <laughs> yeah, uh, seven minutes. So, let me just, let me cook, let me cook. pH alpha minus pH alpha. Part partition, we got alpha and a, the sum of all alpha and a, delta alpha i plus the i and b. Yes, sir. Delta alpha i. And then we apply our theorem. If, our, if i is an a, then this is less than or equal to epsilon. If i is in b, if i is in b, then this is less than 2k. Again, by our magic, we have go to, well, this is less than we do the entire sum. The entire sum. Well, this, right, this is less than 2k delta, right? So it's uh, equal to epsilon of Again, by our assumption five minutes ago, we have deltas less than epsilon. So we have this less than epsilon of alpha of b minus alpha a plus 2k. Since alpha or epsilon is arbitrary, so we have the integral, but integral of h alpha, which is the integral of phi of f of x with respect to d of alpha x exists. And we're done. <laughs>